Hello, welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 74. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Dave, great to see you. Johnny, Salute. my <laughs> favorite, favorite part of my work week. How you doing, man? Oh, it's great. What a what a what a whirlwind this week. Three concurrent cube events, Dreamforce, CrowdStrike, Mandiant, um, Google Cloud. Also, you bought that company. Um, Kevin Mandia is going to a um, um, consulting role, uh, but Mandy and obviously doing great. Um, tons of news. Intel, <laughs> which we've been talking a lot about, uh, announced they're going to spin out their foundry business on the 16th. And then today in the Wall Street Journal, just posted on Twitter, um, Qualcomm has approached Intel for a takeover. Man, talk about the tail wagging the dog, Dave. This is really wow. a train wreck. Wow. For Intel, That's so uh, you were right. Eighty-seven billion. <laughs> you were right. You know, all the other analysts got it wrong. So um, you were right. So well, again. partially, they really haven't taken the full step that I'd like to to see. But mm, it's a it's a half step. Andy Jassy this week brings the hammer down on remote work. That's going to be a huge conversation. I shared a clip from 2020 where he talked about his philosophy it was early indicator where his head was at. But you can see that going on there. That was big news. Um, Salesforce, tons of agent force, which is their big focus. Salesforce doubling down on AI big time. This is probably the most strategic shift I've seen Salesforce make in their existence. I mean, they've made some shifts with acquisitions, indirect, organic, indirect growth uh, versus organic growth. This is clearly an organic growth. We had great exclusive interviews with president of the data cloud and MK who's been on the cube many times, um, but very great insight into the agentic systems building on our breaking uh, coverage, groundbreaking coverage of agentic systems, among other things, digital twins and the economist we've talked about. And then, you know, just in general, a lot of good action coming out of security. Again, two of the major security players in my mind relative on the spectrum. One is CrowdStrike uh, had their event. You were there. I was at Mandiant. They're the leader in threat intelligence, well-known first call uh, for any kind of um, re response, prevention, um, triaging around threats, cyber criminals, cyber war, espionage conversations, really there, really the alpha kind of security conversations. And of course, that's in the midst of the entire landscape of uh, the security market. So, you know... Um, that's going on. And then you know, Silicon Angle's got a ton of stories building on our editorial and our cube research uh, work around the SaaS scramble to agentic AI, of which we pointed out here on the cube pod, SaaS is evolving. Cloud SaaS is evolving to uh, agentic as one of the categorical clear lines of sight into applications, uh, applications with gen AI, clearly agentic, which is going to open up as we pointed out in our security coverage this week, you know, application security will be a big part of that uh, around Gen AI. And of course, there's a back office implication around governance and uh, you know um, cataloging of the data because it's obviously a data problem and a risk management problem. So governance and cataloging again, these are areas we've been covering. And then you know, obviously, the um, I love the story. Even uh, Charles Fitzgerald picked it up on Platformomics around um, you know Three Mile Island nuclear plant reopening for Microsoft. So nuclear power. You know, remember, Larry Ellison brought this up at Oracle yeah. Cloud World around nuclear um, energy being used to power these big GPU monster data centers, cloud scale capabilities, and just you know new models, new services hitting every day. Obviously, Dreamforce really kind of set the table. I mean, and, and going outside their swim lane of really building an ecosystem, that was the big story in my mind. And then just around the enterprise, just you know, Intel's the big story. Um, there's a lot of con conversations around open source. Uh, Amazon's open search uh, project was revealed. Um, IBM bought KubeCost, um, uh, a company in the Kubernetes ecosystem, obviously cloud native. IBM, Watson, X, obviously also at Dreamforce. We had them on. We had AWS. Again, this was a, was a flurry of activity this week uh, from all the big players, all coming on the Cube, all being featured on SiliconANGLE. And, of course, the Cube research team digging in and getting all the data, um, really, really in, in, interesting week. Everything from the work environment changing back to the office with Andy Jassy's memo to AWS, as well as they're cutting all the fat, middle management fat um, that they've kind of bloated up to be. 
And of course, you know, they're, they're obviously changing in real time, but Dave, the, 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 to me, I mean, it's Intel story continues to swirl. I know you're on it. What's your take of the yeah, news? So obviously he, the spin out found a foundry. Yeah. And well, so let's, now the overtures from Qualcomm. Right. So then let's share the, 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 what Pat wrote in his memo, in his blog, he said, greater independence for Intel Foundry. To build on our progress, we plan to establish Intel Foundry as an independent subsidiary inside of Intel. This governance structure will complete the process we initiated earlier this year when we separated the P&L and financial reporting for Intel Foundry and Intel products. So this, to me, is the key line here, and it's telling. A subsidiary structure will unlock important benefits. It provides our external Foundry customers and suppliers with clearer separation and independence from the rest of Intel. I'll come back to that. Importantly, it also gives us future flexibility to evaluate independent sources of funding and optimize the capital structure of each business to maximize growth and shareholder value. The former statement, it, it, one could infer from that that, oh, that's the problem that Intel Foundry is having. Nobody wants to do business with Intel because they're competitive. I, I think it's complete obfuscation of the core issue which I've said is volume and cost structure. We laid that out last week. I won't you know, repeat it in depth. Uh, I, I think that is, again, smokescreen. The second part of that, that it gives us future flexibility to evaluate independent sources of funding, i.e., we're gonna need more cash. And this allows us to spin it out, sell it. You mentioned Qualcomm, um, looking at, or actually, uh, let's dig into that in a moment, but potentially looking at purchasing Intel, Intel's valuation somewhere in the 80 to 90 billion. So this would be 100 billion plus to acquire Intel. That would be a big nut. And, and I'm not sure it's the right thing, by the way. I'm not sure it's 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 the right structure that the chip designer owns the fab. Um, I, I have proposed, I can't remember if I did this last week. I know I put it out on Twitter and I had a little back and forth with Ben Baharin who had an alternative, but I said that Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, NVIDIA, Tesla, Google, Oracle, and possibly IBM should invest in Intel. They should spin out the foundry completely, change the governance structure, spin it as an independent business. These guys that I just mentioned have the balance sheets to fund it. They, oh, by the way, also add in the US government should be part of that with the CHIPS Act dollars. They have the, 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 the chops, the money, and the motivation to have you know, onshore uh, manufacturing. Ben responded, well, they should just invest in Intel instead. And I say, no, I don't think the, the incentive is there enough if they just throw Intel a lifeline the way Apple did with Microsoft, Steve Jobs years ago. I think it has to be a much more structured, independent entity. Um, and then I'll tell you another uh, discussion I had with a Wall Street analyst. He debated with me that I don't think they need we need to build um, advanced chips in the United States. Let's just do what Texas Instrument does and build old generation stuff and make the thing profitable and then worry about advanced chips. I totally disagree. I think you absolutely have to have a source of advanced manufacturing on the United States soil. Intel has um, at least designs on highly advanced manufacturing. One could argue if they can actually make it work to yield, it'll be the most uh, advanced in the world, again, the fundamental problem is they don't have the volume and they don't have the cash to get to that volume. And so this kind of consortium, this independent entity, I think is a possible answer to the problems that they face. This, no, this, this notion that folks aren't doing business with us, they didn't say that explicitly, but one can infer that is, I say, a smokescreen. Well, Intel in 2018, uh, was considering an alternative um, to Broadcom momentum by hostily pursuing Qualcomm. So, you know, table, tables have flipped. Um, that story came out. And the question is, is that I don't see Qualcomm buying Intel at all. Um, I just don't yeah. think they can swallow it. And I don't think they want to. I mean, I think that if I'm Qualcomm, I'm looking for the strategic assets, but I wouldn't want the core products or the foundry. I mean, I think it doesn't make sense for them, but we'll see what they do. But I mean, I, I think... Um, I, I don't see Qualcomm uh, buying Intel at all. You know, John, Al Shugart, famous Al Shugart, nobody knows who Al is anymore, um, but he was a legend. You know who Al Shugart yeah, is, obviously. Course, he invented George. the floppy disk, and he was the, like the top 
you know, disk disk engineer, storage engineer at IBM, and and then uh, then one day said, "F this, I'm leaving." Set up shop, literally set up a table outside IBM San Jose Cottle Road facility and started signing up all the best engineers. Popped them out. I think he took them over to Memorex, and then he popped them out of there and started Shugart Associates, which invented the the first floppy disks, and then of course Seagate, which is you know an iconic company. But he used to. Say to me, if you want to know, because he went on an acquisition binge when he was trying to save Seagate. They went, almost went out of business so many times. And he said to me, Dave, if you want to know if I'm interested in acquiring comp a company, ask me this question. Would I take it if it were for free? And a lot of times my answer would be no. If my answer is yes, then I'm, I'm looking at him. And I would think to your point, I don't know why Qualcomm would want Intel's foundry, even if it's for free. It's just such a difficult business. And I think one company, particularly a chip designer owning it, is not the right uh, regime for Intel Foundry. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, we'll be watching that again. This is just, you know, as you say, urinary Olympics. You know, would they want to free? That's a great way to look at it. I never, never thought about that. Um, Intel obviously got the challenges. Um, but, I mean, I think the big news this week, again, a couple of things happened that jumped out at me was um, Salesforce. Salesforce has always been an insular kind of um, a monolithic company. They've had a great community, um, great cloud, Salesforce, their primary application. But remember, they went on a binge of acquisitions, and they have a ton of stuff. And what got my attention was um, the data cloud piece they're doing and the work we've been covering them on, on the Cube Research. And uh, MK, who's the lead engineer, uh, executive over there, product and engineering, He's working with the president of the data cloud and they're building this harmonization layer. And I think that it's super smart for them to go after the agent market and they call it agent force, um, Salesforce agent force, because I think that is the application layer of the future. As we pointed out last pod in great detail, we actually laid out that at the top of the stack, Gen AI's impact will be at the application layer, ultimately as the end users use it, and continue to use agentic systems. Under the covers, the data layer is going to transform, and obviously the infrastructure is going to be that supercomputing that's been democratized from the NVIDIAs of the world and other providers like the cloud hyperscalers. That's the next gen. Those SaaS apps become agent apps. Um, out, outside of the other new apps that we pointed out, or scalable apps, I call them, um, those are the ones that are new. Those will be the new big powered apps that solve hard problems with a lot of compute, a lot of GPU, scientists, stuff that was old, high-performance computing or HPC. Um, so put that aside for a second. Agentic Systems is just another application, um, but it's different. Again, it changes the user experience. Um, UX is going to be a big part of it. So you're starting to see that the um, impact of Gen AI now is going to be I think evolutionary in the application space, revolutionary from the user experience standpoint, that's where the action will be. And what's going to happen is it's going to also open up the conversations around how do you secure it? How do you govern it? Um, all those similar application security and challenges came with SaaS. We've seen this movie before. So, you know, you go back to mobile, you go back to SaaS, same challenges. Okay. Now the different thing is, is that the back end is also evolving big time. So this is a unique time technically uh, in this industry in, in my entire computer life in the computer industry, 30 plus years, in that both the back end and the front end are innovating at the same time. In other big ways, if you remember web, mobile, SaaS, and now Angentech, these are the big wave markers. Each one of those had different unique uh, areas of innovation and change. The web was a front-end innovation, web pages, consumption, change user experience. Yeah, I guess you can say back-end servers, but okay, not really, not, not a big movement, but still really mainly front-end. Mobile apps, front-end, App Store, we all know that. The iPhone made that happen. Still web app back-end from a tech stack perspective. Enter the cloud era of SaaS. That was a back-end innovation okay, that completely changed the scalability of the industry. And the results are unprecedented. You see the results now. I mean, nuclear power plants, um, powering data centers. I mean, complete game changer. Cloud has done that in the back end. Now, enter the, the wave we're in now, Gen AI, and the impact of that. Both of those areas, back end and the front end, are absolutely 
on fire in a way that is positive, meaning both the back end, the architectures and technologies in the stack, and the front end, the user experience, and all the process that goes in between those completely being uh, reimagined. Uh, and so we've never, I've never seen that ever happen. Uh, every other wave had either one or the other, not both. So I think what's complicated right now, Dave, is that people are trying to figure this out and skate to where the puck is, as they say, the old expression. But guess what? There's many pucks going on. It's like, I mean, there's like, you got the back end tech stack. You can't just, if you're an IT person or anyone in technology, you can't just get a new tech stack and then say, oh, by the way, I don't have the process to, to manage that. So we are completely living in, and this is highlighted in, in the areas like security, like um, the user experience. You can't have the user experience unless your back end is scaling. You can't have security unless you have the process and back end aligned with that. So you're starting to see the success formula of this next gen be around that. That's the power dynamic that's going on. That's the interaction you're seeing, the back end and front end. That's why um, Oracle and Amazon all and NVIDIA are all talking about this because the complete scalability of the back end and change it will drive the front end, which is happening almost independently, but it has to depend on the back end because again, you can't just you know, put a tech stack and not have a good front end. You can't have a good front end unless you have the back end. So, so you know, the old classic back end developer, front end developer, this is the, the new shift. And this is why it's confusing. That's why there's some bubble action. Um, just because you slap on AI, if you don't have the capability or GPUs to power it, you're, you're not going to be successful. So there is so much action going on. The ones that are successful in this new wave have to have both in play. And that's why NVIDIA's stock is so high. That's why Intel's, you know, groping for relevance in in its architecture. And I think uh, an, another notable deal is that Amazon Web Services cut a deal with Intel. So you're starting to have Intel going to Amazon. So if anyone's going to buy Intel, it's going to be Amazon. If I was going to look at that, I would say, hey, why not grab it? You got uh, you already have the silicon action no going on. So to me- No way. It ain't going to happen. Well, why just... would Jassy buy, buy that foundry business? It, it's a- it is a tough business, John. I mean, anyway, I don't want to go rat hole back to on, on no, Intel. No, I'm just, I'm just my, po my point is that deal shows Intel's leaning into Amazon. So Amazon's already uh, winning, right? So, you know, AWS, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, they all need custom silicon. But again, they're, again, they're, they're already winning, right, with the back that's end. Why, so next gen cloud has to sit with AI. So, that, so. That, that to me is the big story. But that's why I think that my plan here, my proposed plan of these companies, you know, they don't want to give up their cash. They're like, hey, yeah, let the U.S. taxpayers fund this stuff. Why should why should Apple or Amazon or Microsoft use its balance, Google use its balance sheet? It's because, well, here's what I would say. The U.S. government should go to them and make this happen and say, look, guys, we'll play by the antitrust rules. We'll take the foot off. Of, we'll take Lee Nakan's foot off your neck if if you participate in saving Intel and Foundry, and by the way, it's going to take 10 years. We're going to have to pour a ton of dough into it, 100 plus billion is my estimate, maybe more. And But it's going to allow us to eventually get to a point where we can get some volume. Oh, by the way, you're going to have to give some of your volume to Intel, like a substantial amount of it, way for scale, so that they can get on the curve again of rights law, everything we've talked about, it will take a decade. Uh, but I want to come back to agent force, John. I mean, I am super excited about that. Uh, I think Benioff is right on. I think he's a visionary. To me, this reminds me of when Oracle did Fusion. So Oracle database company at the time, uh, Charles Phillips, known then as Chuck Phillips, was an analyst at Morgan Stanley. And he wrote a seminal piece on how the software industry was going to consolidate. This is the application software industry. Um, and and it did, but it did in part because Larry hired him, Chuck Phillips, now Charles, to actually affect all that consolidation. He brought in all these applications. They were all different, all disparate data, all different protocols and, and underlying technology. And Oracle took, I mean, literally a decade to build Fusion so that they could integrate all these backend apps. And it's been a game changer for Oracle. It's got now very much, you know, some of the most integrated uh, software, application software technologies out there. I see Agentic as 
a similar effort. You mentioned the data cloud. You mentioned the harmonization layer. Uh, there's an orchestration component to this. There's a management of all those agents. The, I, this is, to me, more than just a new application. It is the new application stack because what's going to be different this time around when you think of things like microservices and even um, a service orientation, service oriented um, uh, architectures, SOA, you can invoke these services as you need them. They're static services, however. Microservices are hard coded. Agents are going to be able to unlock all those pieces that haven't been able to be coded. It's going to take some time. This is, this is futuristic. But agents will be able to observe human behavior and then eventually respond to them in ways or, or, or act uh, in ways that mimic that human behavior. Whereas before with microservices, you couldn't necessarily hard code every little you know, process in a business. You're going to be able to automate much more with Agentic. And I think Benioff is onto something. He's a visionary. He's a baller. Uh, he's a philanthropist. Uh, and you saw it firsthand at Dreamforce. And the other piece of this that's really important is these agents are going to be able to interpret and, and be governed by top-down goals. There will be top-down goals, top-down metrics. And think of a, a tree, some kind of hierarchy that says, okay, here's the top-level goal. Gain market share. And here's the strategies and the tactics that we're going to use to do that. We're going to build new solutions. We're going to optimize pricing. We're going to launch new programs. And then beneath that are all the details around that. The agents are going to be governed by those top level metrics. And then they're going to be able to, 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 to deliver a bottoms up outcome. And the reason why this is so interesting is because within Salesforce's estate of all the applications that it controls, Salesforce and Slack and MuleSoft and all the other components of its, of its stack, it has the business logic, it has the data, and it has written, as you point out, it's done the hard work to write that harmonization layer. It's still, you know, early days. It needs a lot of work. Uh, but then all the data is in the data cloud. They have that harmonization layer. I've made this point before. So that revenue actually means revenue. It doesn't mean ARR, doesn't mean bookings, doesn't mean NRR. Revenue means revenue. So you're not arguing about where this data come from, it's all harmonized. And that is, I think, the future of the enterprise application stack. Yeah, and I think the business side of the equation that Salesforce has is huge. I wrote a big research note on this. I wrote uh, two of them last week on thecuberesearch.com. Check it out. Um, many deep dives, specifically around um, this harmonization layer. And I think Salesforce has a good opportunity to you know, a, you know, change the business landscape conversation around this um, as it goes through this uh, shift with generative AI to customize. I mean, my my key points were from the, from the data we had is customization, personalization is going to be huge. Um, the sales data cloud is going to be two areas, two cloud areas that they have been working on um, specifically to get value. And and Salesforce always had the reputation of being siloed, but Gen AI and G agents allow them to build an abstraction layer to you know, uh, enhance the operations of these systems and make it easy to use. Now, remember, Salesforce has a huge community. And like I said, they've been very monolithic. The big story coming out of their, their, their event, Dreamforce, is they now have to have an ecosystem. So you start to see classic ecosystem we would see at big winners like AWS uh, and Google Cloud and, and others, where you start to see independent software developers uh, solution providers come on board where you have to have non-Salesforce um, product, meaning third-party integration. So, you know, the, this is going to change their service cloud and data integration, which I did a separate research, research note on, really is the key. And I think unifying the data sources and leveraging advanced AI capabilities will be their opportunity. And if they can build that platform, Asian Force, that integrates uh, data from various systems to give that comprehensive view that'll enhance decision making and ultimately provide more sales to companies because now it's not just about the sales motion and the data of a system of record which they basically are they can bring some of the ux skills they have with their trailblazer community to the table now their events have always been like oh you get the trailblazers and you got salesforce it's a money machine 
stock's always great. It's never down. It's always a good long play stock. But now, you know, with the with the Gen AI, they can incorporate the data cloud as an instrumental piece to their business. Get the language models in there. Get the multi-model foundation models to bring relevant content to both salespeople and business decision making. This is a new opportunity to go beyond the sales category, bring decision making into the equation, get that data grounded um, and its proprietary data in their system, bring in third-party ecosystems and enable automated workflows. This is going to be very conversational input. This is going to be the future. And I think MK, the interview we did with MK, uh, he goes by MK, he's the head of it. This will power not only uh, connecting and unifying the data, but think about think about Salesforce. They have MuleSol. All those acquisitions that was once uh, an Achilles heel for them now is a competitive advantage. Yep. This is huge. And so, I think that's, that's the, to me, if you peel back the onion, Salesforce, again, this is why I think it's a one of the most strategic moves they've ever made. They've made a lot of moves. Oh, we're announcing this because Penny Off is a visionary. He's usually viewed as a fashion guy. Hey, you know, it's fashionable, the shiny new toy. This is legit, okay, because there's real dollar impact on decision-making. And if you can get Salesforce to, to do that, get the guardrails, get the governance in place, and get that data harmonizing, that is huge. And I think that is why I like that this, this movement because – one, it opens up an ecosystem. You get more people participating. More data comes in. It's a power law like we've been putting out. And it, it allows them to expand their existing app portfolio and make it relevant and make it valuable. So, again, this is a huge opportunity for them. Um, this could be company shaping, Dave. Again, the future apps are agentic. The agents and sub-agents, as we've covered with Cube Research, you and George Gilbert, whether digital twins and other simulations, uh, Gen AI will certainly change the game. Uh, and the, so only, I, the only way they can, they can screw it up in my mind is by not delivering. I, I, well, that's <laughs> execution is 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 critical. Uh, but I would say this: the integration piece, I think, is aspirational right now. I think they got plenty of work to do internally to actually. When Mark talks about making this work. I first of all, I love the Clippy uh, quip. Right? He likened <laughs> uh, Microsoft's agent, their co-pilot, to Clippy. Uh, remember Clippy? We all, well, many of us remember Clippy, the, the little help thing on Microsoft Windows, which was horrible. Uh, but he's right in the sense that single agents, they're not, they're, they're not the thing. They're the co-pilot. That's one agent, eh, uninteresting. Multiple agents, and I tweeted this at him, um, is I like the Clippy. I love it, actually, the little, the, the little slap at Microsoft. But the real Interesting part of this is the hard work that they've done. You're talking about the harmonization layer and, and the other tech. There's some real engineering here. Again, it's 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 early. It's 1.0. They've got a lot of work to do to make this stuff, you know, really, really effective and, and make a difference. And I'm hoping that they they do execute to your point. But here's what I wanted to say. The third party thing is interesting because imagine you're one of these modern data stacks, like a Snowflake or a Databricks, and you know, you're building these data lakes and your hope is that people are going to build apps on top of them, data apps. Well, Salesforce is saying, well, build them on top of ours. Like you say, they got Heroku, they got MuleSoft, all these things that people thought were boat anchors. And now they've become really leverageable assets. So where are you going to build your data app? If you're all in on Salesforce, you're going to, Think about, hey, I'm going to build apps on top of this because I got the business logic. I have the data. It's harmonized. It's all in the data cloud. I'm paying for it already anyway. So as Snowflake and Databricks come up the stack, they have to think about this harmonization layer. If they're going to move toward these open table formats, which, which Databricks has you know really pushed and popularized, Snowflake has uh, been 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 responsive to that market trend. Then. We've talked a lot about the governance aspects of it. That's really important. But what's also really important is how are you going to build apps on top of this stuff if you don't have a harmonization layer? Snowflake has a data cloud, right? But that harmonization layer, where's that come from? Is that going to come from some third party? If it comes from a third party, then that's going to be the source of value. Whereas Salesforce has something that's highly integrated, uh, at least on paper. And, and that again, to us, is the future of, of the application stack. And it's, it is super exciting.
Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, it's awesome. And Amazon doing a deal with Intel again, that's a sign of cloud, cloud games are evolving. Um, also, the nuclear power comment, we heard that again last last week from uh, Larry Ellison. What's your take on, on the hyperscalers, Dave, right now as they look at this wave? And then we'll get into security. Um, well, security I'll just say this about the Amazon Intel deal. I mean, that, everybody knew that was going down. I mean, they made an announcement. That's fine. That's they they did a press release. Again, Intel has to prove that it can it can do you know get the quality out of eighteen A, um, and get and and get the cost right. You know, maybe you know you you and I we know that Intel sort of fumbled at Amazon, fumbled at that account, um, and 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 ARM was all over it. And so uh, because of that, a Perner acquisition, we've talked about that a lot, but Intel sort of lost its way. And Pat, when Pat came in, he was like, guys, uh, Amazon is the, the biggest whale in the sea. They're the future of infrastructure. What? <laughs> we got to do a better job there. So it was always known that they were going to do something. Together. I, I wonder what kind of concessions Intel has had to may, make price-wise. Um, and so we'll see how, how much volume they can get out of that but i think it's a very positive in terms of in, in regards to the hyperscalers you know the latest etr data the spending data from our partner data partner shows that you know all this talk about repatriation you know there's repatriation you know there's you know call it single digit repatriation the vast majority of the activity in the workloads continue to 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 grow in the cloud uh when you ask folks where they're going to where they are today in terms of percent of workloads in the cloud and, and where they're going to be in the future. It ke keeps growing. Um, the latest data, I can pull it up if you want, is it's either approaching half or is it's, 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 it, and it's going to go beyond that. Uh, so that, I don't see that trend changing. Add Oracle now to the mix. Oracle, you pointed this out last week or a couple of weeks ago, Oracle growing its cloud at, you know, 50, 60% a year, outpacing the other, Three hyperscalers. I shouldn't. I'm, I'd be careful about the other three hyperscalers because, um, you know, my my benchmark is Charles Philip Phillips, uh, not Charles Phillips. Uh, uh, Charles Fitzgerald, until Fitzy declares them a hyperscaler with his capex <laughs> model, I'm skeptical. But still, Oracle's doing a great job there. They're growing. So my point is that the the public cloud is clearly continuing its uh, breakneck pace at what will be a $200 billion business this year, growing at nearly 20%. And that is pretty astounding. Having said that, you know, the on-prem guys are getting it together too. You know, you see Dell um, with some business momentum, HPE, you know, Oracle still has a big on-prem business. So, um, you know, spending is still not where we'd like to see it. It's still maybe a point ahead of GDP. Maybe even it's even trickling, expectations are trickling down a bit. Um, so until AI stops stealing from other budgets and starts throwing off some cash, as we've talked about, I think that macro climate will stay constricted. But, you know, in the Game of Thrones, cloud continues to win. Interesting. What do you think about the uh, Andy Jassy uh, memo that came out this week on uh, <laughs> returning you know back to much, the office? You know, you know how much we love Jassy. Uh, well, we should set up what was announced. Basically, they announced that you, by in January, uh, January third, I guess you got to be back to the office full time, five days a week. I was surprised. I thought they would maybe go to four days a week. I think the big question for a lot of Amazonians is, well, wait a minute, I, I'm I've been remote, so they have a, a rule now that you have to badge in three days a week at Amazon, but they have exceptions for remote employees. It's very unclear what happens to those remote employees. Do they have to move or leave? You know, we don't know yet. And so I, I don't know. I, I, I'd love to know what you think, John. I mean, I think it's, yeah. um, I get it. I get why they're doing it. I, I do feel it's a little bit draconian, uh, maybe by design. I mean, I, think, I mean, I, I, cut a, I cut a clip out from a Cuban interview I did with Andy when he was the CEO of AWS in 2020. He shared some of his sentiment around virtual events um, he's always been a big, big believer of face to face. And, you know, if you're project based, yeah, I think working at home is key. If you have a, a company that requires talent um, and acquiring skill with the skill gaps problem we have, 
um, you need to go um, remote. If you're like, say, cybersecurity company, um, it's hard to get people and they like to work remote and they're, that's what they do. If you're a business that requires collaboration and invention, which Amazon and Jassy live by that ethos, they want people on whiteboards together. They want, you know, the face to face. It's important to their culture. And that was the big point of his note. Of course, people took him to task and say, hey, you know, he's it's not what we want. Um, but the reality is, is that that is their culture. Now, one part of the announcement wasn't just going back to work. He acknowledged that Amazon's gotten the middle management um, fat and he's going to cut that. He's going to have change the direct reporting structure. He's going to eliminate the middle management and they're going to li- eliminate me- pre meetings about the meet pre meetings, which we know we hate and everyone hates having a meeting about the meeting. Um, and he wants to go back to the uh, original formula for AWS and Amazon, which is, you know, we have the the exercise of working backwards and also let's get into the room and debate and align and then work and together as a team. So to him, this is absolutely a cultural issue. Uh, I think he firmly believes, as do I, that, you know, that's key. Now, personally, five days a week, I mean, I think the compromise and I think a good solution is, you know, give it a little bit up on that. I mean, I think you can, you can still be successful by balancing that, notwithstanding that specialty of skilled employees. I mean, I would much rather have better employees that are super talented and that work remotely than uh, a lot of people in one place. So I think, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how this works out. I think clearly from them, it's really more of a testament. And sometimes it's something hiding in plain sight, like, okay, layoffs, cuts, um, you know, that came up a little bit in the conversation. I don't think he thinks about that as a primary first principle. I think Amazon's first principle is we're customer obsessed and we're builders and that we try things, we kill it fast, we double down on it, um, um, do the undifferentiated heavy lifting. But he clearly believes that it's a better environment if you're working together on teams uh, in, in, in a physical location. And so they're they're making people choose, and they and he even said we're putting our relocation behind. This is not a it wasn't designed to be a mass layoff. This is designed for really worker productivity and eliminating bureaucracy. And he he even said I got a mailbox. He's going to be reading emails, and he called his employees and said, hey, you know if you see waste, uh, you see areas that have become uh, bureaucratic. My, my word, I don't think he used that word bureaucratic. Email it to this address, email box, and he's going to read it and he's going to take uh, suggestions. So. You know, I think he's he's saying all the right things, but five days a week, Dave. I mean, come on, that's a little bit over the top. But I'm I'm not running Amazon, so um, I'm I'm not super critical of it. And I get why he's doing it. And I think I'm think it's fine for Amazon's culture. You don't want to work there, then don't work there. Yeah, you I mean, mean, I, yeah, I, mean, I kind of make, agree, John. You can make a lot of money on Amazon if you're an employee. They give RSUs out generously. <laughs> uh, so you know, I mean, Amazon's not a not a place for the faint of heart, right? If you have a side hustle no. and you're trying to yeah, you know, fake it till you make it, and you're not gonna you're not gonna survive there. I, I mean, a part of me really does agree. With, I mean, I come to the office every day, and I like when there's people every day. Every now and then, I'll I'll work, you know, remotely. But I much prefer being in the office. Uh, I I find that I'm way more productive. I think you know during the the pandemic, people were saying, "Wow, it's so much great productivity here." Um, I, I, I think part of that was sort of a sigh of relief that they could stay in business. I think the other part is, you know, maybe they they for, for, uh, held off, you know, spending money on new plant property and equipment and particularly facilities. Uh, but I agree. I think at the end of the day, if you have a whiteboard uh, for many roles, certainly engineering, um, sales, marketing, uh, of course, sales you want out in the field as well, but, but in the go-to-market, um, certainly a product, uh, certainly strategy. You want people in the office. Um, but I still think there are roles that can be very effective remotely. You know, Dell, I think, has an interesting balance. Dell, right after the pandemic, was like, hey, bring your best self, work wherever you want. Kind of a year later, they were like, yeah, it's time to come back to the office. Let's go. Mm-hmm. And they said, three days a week, you got a badge in. And then more recently, they said, you know, we're going to ask you to declare whether you're, uh, you know, on site or remote. And I think there might even have been a third hybrid. And basically they said, look, we're not going to fire you if you declare remote, but your advancement opportunities are going to be less than if you're in the office and you're seen. So they said that. 
And I don't, I don't know anybody who got fired because they that they declared remote. And I do know, even though Dell recently had some layoffs, I do know several people that were working remote that did not get laid off. So they're kind of true to their word there. But I felt like that was a more balanced approach. Uh, but, you know, like you said, Amazon's a unique place. He's like back to day zero. <laughs> day zero. All right. So let's get into the events we went to. What was your takeaway from uh, CrowdStrike? CrowdStrike was amazing. Um, so I, I, there was a lot of trepidation on my part going in because, of course, I have, you know, I have data, the spending data with our partners, ETR, on CrowdStrike. It doesn't look pretty. No surprise. CrowdStrike has had to reset its ARR expectations. So they've acknowledged that. Um, I've I've always given George Kurtz high marks for transparency and fast response. Um, and and I think it, so did the audience there. I was struck by several things. One, first thing he said when he came out on stage was tongue in cheek, how was your summer? So that was pretty funny. <laughs> That was, and, that's, but that's then he went acknowledging right into, what everyone's thinking. Yes, but then he went right all business, um, and he made it about business resiliency. Um, so it's like the apology tour was over. They did that, and he's thinking, he's moving forward, um, looking ahead, and and it brings up. I talked to a lot of customers about this. They said, "Look, do you remember the flash crash, John? Mm -hmm. Where they called it a glitch? That's a, a glitch is is a word that means I don't know what the f actually happened." You know, it's a technology glitch. And so tech fails sometimes. And we talk all the time about, you know, all these um, restrictions and, and warnings about cyber. And you see the executive orders around cyber security. There's, there's as much risk in, in, in technology and in, in terms of legacy tech, uh, especially, and even modern tech, as there is in cyber risk. So, so that focus on business resiliency, I think really resonated with people. And then the big surprise, he said up front, look, we may have a surprise guest. I'm not going to tell you who it is until that person shows up. I thought it was Jensen, right? I thought, here's Jensen again. Well, it wasn't Jensen. It was Satya Nadella. So Satya Nadella had a board meeting that day. He, he, he came in, um, you know, remotely to the conference and they talked about uh, the partnership. So as you well know, this all went down on Microsoft platforms. And as you also know, uh, CrowdStrike and Microsoft are competitors. But it looks like it's like Bill Belichick and Bill Parcells, the Jets and the Patriots. Parcells, remember, said, the border war is over, right? Yeah. Remember he said that? That's when he went to Dallas. That he was not so, the Jets, I don't think, at that time. It's like the same... Yeah. Oh no, I think he was with the Jets. Maybe he was not. The Jets, yeah, he got a com he got compensation anyway, for Belichick. I said, well, I used that line, I think, last week with Oracle and Amazon. But anyway, it was all um, it was all business. And I will tell you, I talked to at least uh, twenty customers, and to a person, they were really happy to see Satya up on stage, and they said we were really thrilled about that. The other thing they told me was shit happens in tech, so you know we're going to give these guys a mulligan. They were very responsive and they got the best product. So this isn't like solar winds where it was kind of like a legacy product. I mean, the spending data looks like solar winds, by the way, uh, but, but the product is the best of breed in the industry and customers say, we love the product. We love the comp company, you know, stuff happens. Um, and, and the other thing is the options to leave CrowdStrike aren't that great. I mean, the number one option is probably Microsoft. And we all know, you know, what kind of security risks you're exposed with Microsoft. So I think the vast majority of customers are going to stay with, with, with CrowdStrike. I think they're going to get through this. They're going to fight their way back. George Kurtz also invoked the sort of Tylenol example. Where they remember Tylenol, they didn't really have a crisis management team, but they did all the right things. They took all the, the bottles off the shelf. Uh, and I think the last thing I'll share with you is they have this flex pricing model where you can mix and match. You can use essentially like cloud credits on any of their products, sort of pull and push, right? Use, not use, and then apply it somewhere else. So I think they're going to really intelligently use that flexible pricing model 
uh, to get through this. And it was really a great show. Oh, I'm sorry. The very last thing I'll say is we had um, guys on, former FBI. Uh, we had Adam Myers on, who's incredible. He had this late night podcast that I attended. Uh, we had their CTO on, the partners. AWS came on. It was a very, very strong person. Uh, it's an in-person event, 6,000 people. And they were at max capacity at the ARIA. They're, they're, they're going to outgrow, outgrow that. Well, I had, um, this guy's good summary. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, the, let's um, hear about Mandian. Well, and, Mandian, and... Man, Mandian is an interesting conference because it's always the um, the impressive lineup of experts, thought leaders, practitioners discuss the latest developments in cybersecurity, mm -hmm. cyber warfare, espionage, um, cyber criminals. So it's very much about threat detection, threat management, and defending. So Mandian is known for really um, owning um the defense aspect of it and they have a they have phil venerables who was with goldman sachs mentioned many times in the keynote and and kevin mandia who on the came on the cube um the founder um he sold the company to google and i was a special advisor um they're all about defending and so the ethos of the company is very family oriented in the sense of we're a team sport uh, and, as it is in the security industry but it the key themes that jumped out of there was clear um, gender of AI, it's about gender of AI and all the, all the threats. So as one, someone said, yeah, we're the, 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 the CISO these days deals with two things that in board meetings, peanut buttering, all of the fires they're putting out and then talk about gen AI. And so you have the classic barrage of threats and for the, you have to defend against and the bad guys, the, um, and balancing the asymmetry between offense and defense, and then what gen AI is going to be. Now, what was interesting was it was pretty much general consensus that, um, AI helps, generative AI helps the defenders more than the offense. Now, remember that poll you did? You did a poll about this at, I think, RSA. And it, yep. was, it was interesting results. People said, well, mostly the, the bad guys. Not really. The general consensus amongst the experts is it's helping the defenders. Um, and they're getting better at, at protecting. Um, but from general perspective, the key insights were balancing innovation uh, with with risk. How do you maintain the operational efficiency while securing your posture that you currently have and not giving anything to the bad guys? And then framework for AI integrations was key. Um, ransomware was a huge topic. The evolution and defense strategies around ransomware continue to be top of mind. And, the, and specifically, uh, the role of law enforcement. So people are getting taken out. So that Kevin Mandy has said to me, quote, the only way to, to stop this is to take the bad guys off the field. That's my, my words. Um, but he said something to that effect. And you're starting to see um, these groups get taken down. But what's happening with ransomware, it's smash and grab. And it's also they're reconstituting their, their business models as fast as they get caught. So unless you take them off the field, they're going to just get reform again. So that was a clear message. Um, the ransomware as a service, a new category is emerging very, very fast. Basically, it's like you can buy a ransomware team as a service, as another another economic opportunity. So, it, it, you know, I made the joke that ransomware is a classic product market fit for the bad guys. It's just getting better for them. And what's interesting is the not, the average um, sale, if you will, the average ticket price of a ransom has gone up to over a, to averaging about a million and a half. Healthcare in particular is highly targeted. So that that was a huge conversation. I was actually surprised that ransomware was a, still dominant in the defense side of it. Oh yeah. Now now, now ransomware is not a is not a dwell time issue. So espionage and the criminals uh, are are starting to form lines. The ransomware side is they get in there and extort, right? Get the data out. And in some cases, uh, not even encrypting the data. So not in and they're not even bringing the data. They're just stealing the data and then uh, exfiltering it out as fast as possible, smash and grab, and then sell it back or sell it to somebody else. So getting the data is really the ransomware game. So you get the extortion piece of it, ransomware where you lock them down like a healthcare organization where people are dying, um, which came out, by the way. And then two, forget encrypting it. It's just cost, it's cost a good sold to them. <laughs> I've just got the data. I'm going to sell it. So, so smash and grab, either lock them down, extort them or extort them through the sale of the data. So all about getting the data on the espionage side, you start to see things where they get in and they, they move around and they get lateral movement. And then they want to essentially stay in there as quietly as possible uh, until they um, are found. And then they hide, they go in uh, on espionage side, they're going into critical infrastructure and causing disruption and chaos and, and mostly Chinese 
uh, espionage going on and they're hiding waiting for as like a like a zombie cell like a sleeper cell waiting for the call in case of some action in say taiwan so it's so, not so say the u.s goes to taiwan um they'll activate all their sleeper cells so to speak and that's what's happening with espionage so to me china huge piece of the puzzle there um so that was the interesting again that's some national security implications so again mandy it's always involved in all these things and kevin mandy has always been a hawk on this so love what he does and again mandy has, does a great job so ransomware and then also espionage was two of the big cyber security threads uh, and then just in general, generic, uh, more broadly around the industry, you know, securing the cloud, shared responsibility, shared fate. So in other words, take, accept your risk. You know, someone has to, in an organization, accept the risk. That was a key point by Kevin Mandia. Accept the risk, accept, accept accountability, and then be prepared to talk about it to the board. So this set it and forget it not happening you got to have that shared responsibility and the the evolution of uh, the operations centers security operations or socks was another discussion and then the big trend that came out of that show was the ux side of it and obviously google's got gemini gemini is providing great benefits with generative ai and what's changing is the operational efficiencies around how to consume the data how to consume the defense threats how to remediate how to isolate how to triage so Mandiant's AI and security operations was highlighting that the UX is a big part of it. So you're going to see security operations and SOCs become much more, um, I guess, seamless and much more, you know, consumable for, to be better productive at the job. So, you know, um, you know, the key takeaways, proactive AI security, rethink ransomware defense, strengthen the cloud security posture, enhance your threat intelligence programs, do more red teaming. And I think, you know, when they look at that, that is going to be a big deal. You heard a lot about that. Most companies can't even be prepared for the putting a stress test on things like recovering. And cyber resilience, Dave, really shined in this in this event. And and I think um, the big point there was you got to learn how to recover. And they were kind of talking about the recent CrowdStrike events where you know recovery is not possible. And most of the red teaming, when they simulate red team, is the 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 good guys pretend they're bad guys and they try to to break in and do those things, whether it's consultancy or their own teams, they don't actually red team everything. They don't red team a, what he calls a red lever event, Kevin Mandy, where you pull the red lever when, okay, now get back online. Getting off, off, off the internet, for instance, most companies can't even like say they're being attacked, can't like unplug. That's huge. I mean, think about that. Our biggest companies can't unplug if they wanted to. So again, that was the conclusion for me. It's the state of the future of cybersecurity. And again, probably had some of the same themes that you saw, um, but yeah, that was pretty much the net net of it. That's That that was my takeaway. I, I, I want to share some other data. I, I like what you said about dwell time doesn't even matter anymore. And um, that's a really important point that you're making. CrowdStrike shared in its threat hunting report data that said last year, the breakout time, breakout time is the time it takes an adversary to get in and then start traversing the network horizontally, laterally. Um, the the last year, the breakout time was 63 minutes and the fastest, the world record, if you will, was like seven minutes. Uh, this year it's down to 63 minutes and two minutes is the, the record breakout time. So it doesn't matter how long they're, they're there dwelling, it's irrelevant now. It's like your speed to be able to detect and respond ideally keep them out but you can't always do that um so that was a really important point and to your point dwell time you know doesn't matter yeah i mean dwell time again it's dwell time is a different cyber criminal thing it's mostly espionage and and or um exfiltration of data so you know dwell time for browsing like where am i i go navigate around and there you know kevin mandian's message was you know Lateral movement's critical. That's a, a theme that's been around for a while. Um, but, you know, lateral movement is something you got to detect. And again, this is where all the all the vendors are playing well. And um, the ecosystem actually at MWISE, which is Demandian's conference name, also was there. You had, um, you had Trellix. You had a bunch of companies in there coming in and, and saying how they're working with Google AI. So Trellix has, has a great product. Uh, Sentinel One was really standing tall with their purple AI, which is getting better and better. I thought that was pretty compelling. Um, and just in general, 
um, you know, the people themselves were like, Hey, you know what, we're going to continue to dominate. And you had, you had all kinds of people talking about that, even price waterhouse Cooper, but we had mostly Google cloud folks on uh, threat intelligence. Um, how do you use generative AI in operations? So again, UX again was my big takeaway from, from that event. I think the UX piece back to my earlier point about front end, back end process management. I think that to me is key in, in security. And the, and the other notable point was, and for me, it was a dot that connected it big time was, is that, that when you look at, when you look at some of the things going on, application security paradigm is where Gen AI is going to, all the action in Gen AI. So all the work on application security that's been done in the past is kind of where Gen AI will fit in. That seems to be the discussion amongst the experts. And I agree with them. It's, it's part of the agentic systems. The agents are going to, it's a new feature of the application. So all the AppSec review process and procedures will be adjusted that way. And the governance uh, will fall in line. And remember, all the people that have been doing data governance, like the big banks and financial services, they got the, they got the procedure down. So you're starting to see the hygiene already there from cloud scale. So I think cloud brings that governance piece to the table. And that muscle is already built in, the, in most of these organizations. It's the, it's the down market companies, the medium-sized businesses. Those are the ones that are going to have to get uh, up to speed. And I think the as a service will be a big part of that. So I think the application security will be the paradigm. That was a big dot that connected. Okay, Gen AI is looking just like that. And then, yeah, prompt injections. I wrote a research note on this as well. Prompt injections, um, training, poisoning. So training data being poisoned early on, it's like getting at kids, you know, hey, you want to smoke some cigarettes? You know, it's like bad stuff can happen in the training process. So prompt injections on, on Gen AI from a runtime perspective and then uh, uh, training data poisoning, uh, the two big areas in Gen AI. And then finally, the data, um, the valuable data in these models. So I think those are the three areas in Gen AI that were most talked about. And again, I put that in the research note before the event ended up becoming a key talking point throughout the event. So, so a couple Gen, of things. In Gen AI, that's where the action is. So a couple of things. One is you've been crushing it on the research. Go to thecuberesearch.com. Uh, John's, I think you put out you know five research notes, detailed research notes, not just like puff blog pieces in five days. Um, and I didn't mention the ecosystem. Uh, ecosystem at CrowdStrike's growing. It reminds me of ServiceNow back in the day where it was small, but really starting to grow. We had Zscaler on, they announced some integration with CrowdStrike. CrowdStrike uh, announced a while ago, NextGen Sim, uh, where instead of going out, pushing into a Sim, people were like, well, you got all this data already. Why don't we just push data into CrowdStrike? Keep your data there, we'll put other data in. So um, Zscaler um, was, was there on, and it came on theCUBE with that integration announcement. Uh, Cribble, same thing, you know, I love Cribble. Cribble's like, the way I, I said, they came on the cube and I said, I think about my home. I got a ring. I got like a Simply Safe. I got Google Home. I have all these different apps. Some I don't even remember. I got a generator app. I can't even find the damn thing on my phone. And Cribble sort of brings all that data together, pumps it right into their next gen sim. So Cribble came on. Accenture was there. I always joke. The GSIs love to eat at the trough. So anytime Accenture shows up, you know, there's big business there. And AWS was on as well um, as a premier uh, partner of, of CrowdStrike. So the ecosystem, glad you brought it up, super important uh, in all this. Yeah. And again, it's all good. Again, we're going to continue the coverage. We've got more events coming. Um, we're going we're to continue to rock. Um, just in general, just a very durable week for us on the Cube 3 events. Um, and take uh, some time off, a couple hours today, and hit the gym. Um and uh, try to try to stay in shape but yeah i'm just a busy week and again this fall season's upon us and i'll be pumping out research notes uh, i'm going to be uh, actively converting a lot of our data we get from the cube and our cube research team online and all of our other analysts are, are growing and of course the cube collective dave we had two new additions to the cube collective um so you're going to start to see that grow um the collaboration the open source model of the of silicon angle media silicon angle the cube um Cube Research, and of course, our technology platform with uh, the Cube 365 and the Cube AI has been phenomenal. So, so. Our new, one of our newer analysts, Scott Hebner, just texted me. Uh, he's he's just, a, a, as we speak, putting up his first research note. I, I I read it last night, made very few changes. I mean, it was awesome. Scott, former IBM executive, 
and is technical. So he's writing about AI, causal AI, gets into agentic, explains how things work. Something I didn't know, I learned this reading his post. If you take a string, like a random string of, say, 19 characters, and you copy paste it into a an LLM and say, how many characters in this string? Many LLMs, if you have a 19 character string, many LLMs will come back and say, oh, there are 20. There are 21 or 23. They can't count. And he explains why. <laughs> now, I did the test. Um, ChatGPT failed except for the newest version. Perplexity also was successful. Um, Llama consistently failed. Um, and Claude consistently failed. And I, I don't pay for Gemini. But um, but so that was kind of interesting. And he explains that in, in easy to understand but technical terms. Um, so I'm really excited to see his first post. And um, yeah, so we keep growing. I think we're up to nine analysts now. No, 11. Are we 11? 11 analysts and 13 Cube Collective. So um, now 24 analysts contributing to our open source uh, research, um, continuing to thunder along. We added Randall Hunt, who formerly with AWS. Uh, he's awesome. He's very technical. So it'll be great cloud coverage. Jackie McGuire with Cribble. She's a strategist and um, at Cribble. So she's doing a lot of work. She'll be chiming in, doing some Cube interviews. So and of course, you know, the rest of the um, cast of characters are also contributing from Sanjeev Mohan, Sarvjeet, Zias, Tony Bear, Joe Peterson, Howie Shu, Bob O'Donnell, Merv Adrian, Betty Janode, Adrian Cockroft, Merritt Bear, all the rest and continuing to add value uh, for the community. And of course, Scott Hebner, you mentioned, and Savannah, who's really done a great job of bringing on devices and uh, the AI PC. You'll see a lot of coverage there. David Linthicum's doing great. How's he? David Floyer's work is phenomenal. Semiconductors with you and um, covering all that. So it's all, all good, Dave. So we'll continue. The Super Studio is getting a lot of attraction. We had Equinix in earlier uh, today. That was fun. Um, and other companies, you can see a lot more content coming out of the cube. Um, all, all that converted into data with our new platform. So continuing to, to add that out. And you see a lot more high-frequency insights coming up from our, our team. So if you're listening, check out thecuberesearch.com. Of course, Silicon Angle. Uh, with Rob Hove and the team, they're they're crushing it. The flow there's phenomenal. Relevant news, all all subsidized by the uh, profits we make on the cube. So, we support the cube. We appreciate that. If you want to text us and DM us, hit us up. We're all channels are open, and uh, all, we're having a, having a fun time. Thanks for. Uh, are are you at NYSE next week? I'll be in New York next week doing interviews with uh, Brian Bauman and the team. Trinity uh, Chavez uh, will be there. I'll see them. I'll maybe do a hit with them, but I'm going to be doing some Cube interviews in our studio there. We're going to keep that rolling, keep the, the fire burning as we start setting up for next year uh, with our studio there. So uh, if you're listening and you want to, you're want you in New York, you want to come by and, and, and uh, talk tech TV on with the Cube, let us know. All right, Dave, that's, uh, I think we're at time and have a great weekend. Good to see you. Looking good. <laughs> You're still getting raised there. Look, got a good tan going there. Uh, that's the, it's getting dark here. We got, <laughs> we got, we got the storm coming in. All right. Well, um, thanks for, for listening, everyone. Again, hit us up. Um, we want to hear different content. Let us know. We're always open minded, evolving in the pod. This is episode 74. I'm Sean Furrick, Dave Vellante with Cube. Thanks, everybody.